Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. To fight fraud, you have to be in a position as a merchant to judge in real time whether a transaction is good or bad. And that's why we are more and more defining us as a trader in business decisions. Yeah, um, Since one is the decision whether a transaction is potentially a bad transaction and you rather reject it. The other is the decision whether this transaction might be so lucrative that you perhaps really rather invest even in this transaction by upselling or dynamic pricing or these kind of things. So even our vision statement, we are saying today, um, Frogster is enabling participants in the e-commerce universe to make the best possible business decision using artificial intelligence. That was Chris Mangold, the CEO of Frogster, and he is our special guest this week on episode 142 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Hey, before we get started, I wanted to mention a couple of things. March is Diversity and Inclusion Month, so if you're interested in being a guest or a sponsor of the show, please reach out to me at greg at leadersinpayments.com. Also, February is the Pulse of Payments Month, and we're going to be doing a deep dive into open banking with four special guests from Trustly. I'm personally looking forward to learning more about open banking. Now, on to the show. Have you ever wondered how boat racing relates to being a CEO in the payment space? Well, my guest this week has the answer. A boat racing enthusiast from Bavaria, Frogster CEO Chris Mangold will be the first to tell you that running a successful business has many parallels to leading a successful sports team. So whether you put him on choppy waters or on corporate soil, Chris has what it takes to lead his team towards success. Frogster is a regionally agnostic global platform that manages fraud in real time through AI and machine learning. With this technology, they enable merchants in the e-commerce space to make the best possible business decision when it comes to fraud prevention and chargeback management. Chris talks about the nature of fraud management now and in the future, including what impact blockchain and cryptocurrency may have on the state of fraud in our payments ecosystem. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Chris. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Hi, Greg. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. If you don't mind, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. We'll jump into your professional career a little later, but maybe a a few things about yourself right now. Yeah. You have a Bavarian guy here. I don't know whether you know Bavaria, but most people know Munich Bavaria from the Oktoberfest. And this is exactly where I grew up. And this is also where I live. Yeah. Why am I still living here despite traveling and working around the globe in the last 20 years in my career? I always came back and I always stayed based here since I just like the mountains and the lakes and the green southern German Bavarian surroundings so much. Yeah, really, I went to school here. I grew up here. And then when I started to work for 10 years, I used to work three months in, in Munich and and six months in Germany. Yeah. So as opposed to being a super homie Bavarian guy, I traveled a lot. Okay. Well, let's talk about the company Frogster. So tell the audience what Frogster does. Frogster fights fraud. Yeah, to put it very simple. Very simple one is Frogster keeps fraud away from e-businesses, from e-merchants, and from PSPs. Yeah. And does this by the application of artificial intelligence in real time, super efficient, and with as little as possible um, cutting into the flesh. We call it false positives. So avoiding denial of service to actually good transactions, which could look suspicious since you might know that the most juicy transactions are also the ones which could be fraudulent ones. Large checkouts, rare checkouts, checkouts which are imposed checkouts uh, at the light, late, at, late at night and things like that. So Frogster fights fraud, but with our artificial intelligence, we are doing much more. Actually, to fight fraud, you have to be in the position as a merchant to to judge in real time whether a transaction is 
good or bad. And that's why we are more and more defining us as a trader in business decisions. Yeah. Um, since one is the decision whether a transaction is potentially a bad transaction and you rather reject it. The other is the decision whether this transaction might be so lucrative that you perhaps really rather invest even in this transaction by upselling or dynamic pricing or these kind of things. So even our vision statement, we are saying today, um, Frogster is enabling participants in the e-commerce universe to make the best possible business decision using artificial intelligence. Okay. And you mentioned e-commerce. So are there certain verticals within e-commerce or basically any company that's online you can help? Basically anyone, although the um, fraud and risk situation is totally different when you go over the verticals, yeah, um, which are standard verticals, definitely physical goods and non-physical goods. And then even payment schemes like buy now, pay later schemes. Yeah. And within the physical goods to take the first one, the situation already vastly varies. So if you compare a fashion trader with an electronics trader, you have the situation that the margin in the fashion business is huge. And in the electronics, it's very, very little. And meaning in the fashion, fraud might not even be a topic. Fashion rather lives from conversion and then you have fraud situations that perhaps yeah goods of desire like super new sneakers yeah ripped off by bot attacks so the, even the customer is even paying but you just do not want to have this effect that you are sold out of a specific item in a second yeah um, but really that people steal your goods and resell it is the less case in electronics it's the Totally different situation. Yeah, in electronics, you perhaps have on an iPhone a margin of 1%. That means if you lose one of these iPhones uh, posting and not getting paid, you have to sell hundreds to be back in the money. Yeah, there It's much more about fighting fraud, uh, having a proper catch rate. We call this catch rate. And this might be even beating the need to convert since, again, if you lose one, you have to sell hundreds to be back. Yeah, And then there's other things like... Uh, the non-physical goods, let's take something like entertainment or, or software downloads. Likelihood there is large that people, once they consumed the electronics, uh, non-physical goods, uh, once they played the game, once they did not win the jackpot, once they used the software for graphical purposes, perhaps they find it less attractive later and they try to get out of the transaction. They try to recall the money or to charge back. Yeah, and uh, another uh, non-physical service, which is obviously very huge in the internet, is travel. Yeah, and there, it's this thing is even increased by the factor of the time to travel. Yeah, what does this mean? If I book a package tour today for summer, and um, which looks highly attractive to me, perhaps till summer I change my plans. Yeah, and in this three months or four months till the, the, the travel really happens, I could change my mind, and this also could bring me into the position that I try to recall, revoke the transaction. Uh, and why is this so Yeah, so very toxic in, in the travel e-commerce? Because I've been normally a good user and then I turn a bad user. Yeah? We call it also friendly fraud. And this is hard to catch. Yeah, since normally, you know, normally you recognize fraudsters with Christian Mangold from Bavaria showing up with a Nigerian uh, IP address in the middle of the night, then you can smell a rat there. Yeah, that is perhaps not true. But the same Christian Mangold, totally fine, books his package tour with the proper IP and still he might change his mind later in the time to travel. And this is something very difficult to catch. This you only catch by other risk factors, which you only find out with artificial intelligence. Right. So I know this goes back many years ago, but, and tell me if it's still this way that a business can sort of have different levers that they can pull within sort of their risk tolerance, right? So they could say, hey, we're willing to let certain transactions go through based on certain criteria. And they could go into sort of a dashboard and, and create that. Is that still sort of the way you guys work or with AI, is that completely different now? What's enhanced very much is that you're not looking in the dashboard, but in an ideal case, the dashboard with the score that's underlying in the dashboard is doing the work by its own. Yeah, what's the score? So an AI fraud prevention system always comes back with a score judging on the transaction. And this score takes into consideration all kinds of factors. Yeah, The payment scheme used... The size of the checkout, the day of the, the time of the day, the, the email address, whether this matches the names, et cetera, PPP. Yeah. And then, then you set in the former world 
practically only rules on the score where you say, okay, if the score is like this and that and the transaction is high, then perhaps I manual follow up or I even reject right away. Yeah. And then what's now the development that you get, get along with less and less rules. Yeah. Since the score takes all these factors into account, is self improving, is learning more and more. And you can rely as a merchant on the score only. And this is automation in Orion culture. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So how do you go to market? Do you have a direct sales team? Do you go through partner channels? How do you go to market? For two reasons. First of all, direct sales is efficient when it comes to really bringing across USP. With indirect sales, you always have the issue that you have a filter and that you have to train the trainer or sell to the salee first yeah, and incentivize them indirectly and so on. On the other hand, in payments, actually always indirect partner sales is something you cannot get on without since these partners are also technically integrating you. And this is in most cases the only way to SME merchants or even long-tail merchants. Yeah, since if you have something that's somewhat at sophisticated in payments, be it a buy now, pay later uh, payment or be it a fraud solution, yeah, this is always an integration project. And this integration project takes uh, many days and many weeks, both from side of the customer and side of the provider. And for the longer tail, you only can onboard merchants in an economically viable manner if you do this via a pre-integration with a distribution partner. Okay, that makes sense. And are you available? Is the solution available globally or just within certain regions of the world? No, globally. The beauty of AI-based risk decisions is that you are practically regionally agnostic. Yeah. So this artificial intelligence does not care about the language. It's the same signals Yeah, and they suspicious high checkout, which does not relate with a shipping address, which does not relate the IP address, for instance, just to give um, you a very, very blunt example. This is the same whether it's in uh, Europe or whether it's in Latin or whether it's in, in Northern. Okay. Okay. And how big is the company? We are some hundred people now, mainly based in Berlin and with some satellites in uh, UK, sales-wise in the Netherlands and scientific-wise in Israel. We are a uh, from 27 countries in our in our staff. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, what would you say differentiates your company from your competitors out there? Well, if you say uh, what differentiates us, we first have to have a look at the competition. Yeah. And actually, we can segment the competition in three fields. One are the large incumbents, the counts, the certifieds, most often even uh, card owned. Yeah. Um, huge volumes, mainly very, very strong in the United States based mainly on fraud fighting by rule setting, by rule engines. Yeah? Um, as opposed to those incumbents, we and our competitors are using artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is just um, superior to rule setting on the long run. Although you get far with rule setting if you have huge teams, but if you don't have huge teams and want to grow fast, you need something more smart, which is, by the way, uh, which is definitely machine learning. Yeah? And then the machine learning pillar falls into two segments, one focusing on chargeback protection, chargeback insurance, and the others on risk and fraud management without the chargeback insurance. So from Frogster, you get all three pillars. Frogster is machine learning and artificial intelligence based. We also, if merchants want to have it, offer chargeback insurance. And we have a very sound UX when it comes to rule setting. So this brings us in the position to have actually the most complete uh, suite of services to our merchants and distributors. And the next thing is that we are also believing in a life before and beyond fraud. So our aim is in our platform to, uh, if there's enough demand for that, integrate also other suppliers, which our merchants might be interested in, which are not our core business, but before they shop somewhere else, they get it from us from one hand, for instance, compliance services sanctions list and anti-money laundry. And the next thing is our yeah, trading and business decisions. We are ready today looking into upselling and cross-selling opportunities, uh, identification of that in an automated manner, which is, for instance, the first product we bring to the market, which is credit decisions, where we not only judge on the fraudulent or not fraudulent type of the transaction, but also on the amount of credit uh, the consumer might pay or might be able to serve. And this is this is the next thing. We are not the first mover in this market as compared to our competitors. We are rather one and a half or second mover. So we learned a lot 
And we see now that, for instance, the ones which focus only on the chargeback guarantee get huge volumes since you get more price for that, for more revenue by transaction, but it's a one-trick pony. And once, for instance, the market for chargeback guarantees diminishes, like we see it today in Europe with the PSD2, where there is no any longer fraudulent chargebacks, and then you are in a different place, you know, a complicated place. And that's why we are already preparing now for the life beyond fraud with our up cross-selling and revenue generation products. And where do you see the industry heading? So you can put it in the context of your product and the market you're in, but where do you see payments and therefore sort of fraud and those types of things heading in, say, the next two to three years? There will be less fraud (laughs) in the internet. This is the case since um, there are very, very powerful players fighting fraud. Yeah. For instance, the card schemes or the PayPal's, the huge wallets, all of them have a high interest of reducing fraud levels and increasing trust so that they can do, they can do higher transactions, higher amounts with the consumers with less risk cost. So this means in two years, perhaps too early, but in three to five years, you have to think about what other services merchants can receive or PSPs can receive from you. And this is then besides fraud services, definitely business intelligence services, especially when you talk about the artificial intelligence companies. You have to bring something to the market that brings them in the position to do better business decisions, to accept even more volume, not only in terms of fraud, but also in terms of credit. We had it before. Yeah, You have this buzzword, buy now, pay later, which is huge. And as opposed to fraud, where everybody is against it. For instance, the credit function is something where everybody is for it. Yeah, Since buy now, pay later, be it for the credit cards, be it for the schemes, is something where you increase the purchasing power of the consumer. And this is something they want to have. So let's tap into these uh, revenue and volume generation areas rather than into pure risk fighting, since um, this will be definitely the trend over the next years. Okay. Where do you think or how do you think blockchain and cryptocurrencies, how do you think they play into the future? (laughs) This this is is, um, good. I do not know how much blockchain will help in the e-commerce since for the time being, it's rather business to business or yeah, say hand selected business to consumer or state to consumer application. But this is exactly the right example. Yeah. If you take an analogy, blockchain will very soon perhaps make the notary services really and, and land registers or something like that really redundant yeah and this is then also the fact what a blockchain could do to a payment security or to a pure fraud provider not in the near future but in the far future yeah means this can enhance the trust into the market and means that to be still competitive in the market you have to supply something else than only a fraud information Cryptos, well, crypto is just one application of blockchain-based services. I don't know, this will be mainly, crypto will be mainly uh, another means of payment, which is for the time being not very popular in the internet. Yeah, And we all have to prepare to integrate crypto payments just as payment methods like credit cards, like wallets, like whatever. Um, this is a trend we will see. And this is a trend you will have to be comfortable with. Okay. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So tell us about your professional career and your journey there, how you got to be the co-CEO of Frogster. Yeah, interesting, interesting question. And also now, by the way, I'm now in my in my 10th month. So soon it will be a year. And then we can look back for, for one year as co-CEO at Frogster. I still have the recruitment talks very, very present. And sometimes you kind of draw your conclusions only after. And when we have these discussions, um, it came to me that in my last six career stages, the companies I used to work with were of sizes from 40 people to 10,000 people, yeah, of a startup to 1 billion revenue already. But all these six stations had one factor in common, I never joined a company in my last 10 years, which was older than six years. And I guess this sometimes brings you then to the conclusion what type of leader, what type of manager you are. I phrase it as a growth manager. And this was actually what also brought up our mutual decision, mine, 
Frogs the leadership teams and Frogs the owners decision to bring me on board as the right person to yeah bring the company on the second stage of of growth now yeah if I would be a great founder I would have founded a lot of things my last founding was in year 2000 but from then on I focused in on, on managing growth stories like the one with Sofort like the one with Klarna uh, like the one with Bank Frick Net One and why does this qualify you on your journey uh, you have a lot of been there seen it done it situation. As a growth company, you are always faced with a variety of challenges, but they are somewhat always the same. Yeah, And still being them always the same is, does not mean that there is a textbook or cookbook solution approach to that. But on the other hand, there are some standard situations. So what are these standard situations? You do not found a business and you do not rocket start a business based on processes. Yeah, You have to kick and rush first means that once you gain speed in the business, your processes might be uh, just lagging Yeah, your business development. Means you have to comply with the rules, with the regulations. You have to deliver um, high quality and high availability services with lagging processes. And then you have to build up all these processes Yeah, without losing momentum. And that's the standard situation, building that plane in flight. You have in growth situations. And that's something... Well, it helps you if you've seen that before. Yeah. If you know you're not alone with these challenges, there is hundreds of companies out there with the same challenges, but this does not mean all these hundreds make it. Perhaps only 10 out of 100 make it. And you have to safeguard that you are one of those 10 and not one of those 90, which fail with these growth stage situations. Okay. In your prior positions before Frogster, were you, were those businesses in, in the payments or fraud area or just different software companies? Mainly payments, many payments. And I'm a believer that if you want to really lead a company in payments, you have to learn that a bit. Yeah. So it, it was a support supervisor where I joined the board and this was 10 years ago, my first step into internet payments and support supervising is an account to account transfer scheme in Europe, very, very popular and very, very well reputed. It's actually the account to account transfer scheme still besides Trustly. Trustly, you might perhaps know a little bit more in, in, in the States. Yeah. And we then sold the company to Klarna. And then I joined Klarna as a managing director for, for the DAC area for two years. Later, then I worked for a, a credit card acquirer, Bank Frick, owned by the South African Net One Group, which is on the NASDAQ. You might know them. Yeah. So you have to somewhat learn uh, the payments before you, or if you want to continuously succeed in a leadership role there, since this is uh, it's a regulated business, what you have to know, and it's it's very special. Yeah. And then, whether you come from the fraud angle or for the payment angle, that's the least concern, since you always have to balance conversion, fraud decisions, and reliability of the service. Sure, sure. So as co-CEO, your other CEOs, how do you all divide the responsibilities at the company? Ah, this is a good question. No, we just said we make a smooth transition. Yeah, If you join a new company as a new CEO, you risk to have huge cultural disruption, which is not wished and it's peculiarly not wished in the Froxy situation. That's why we said we allow ourselves a transition phase with and the former, or, or the, not the former, but the founder of the company and the former alone CEO and me co-flying together for a certain time. Yeah. This means that I do all the operational things and the founder does rather the board addressing and the capital market addressing things. And, um, yeah, already now to sneak, we will formalize this very soon. Um, once the transition period is over and we still maintain the sound culture uh, very soon now, my colleague will step up as the executive chairman of the company and I will be the CEO. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So what are some things that you're passionate about? So maybe one work-related passion and one personal passion. It connects a bit, yeah, since I believe that you can only work-relatedly be passionate about things which also personally keep you enthusiastic. And I even use this example often with my teams. Yeah. I'm a race sailor. I'm sailing on boats since I can think. Yeah. I see a huge analogy between being successful as a boat racing team and as a company team or leadership team. Yeah. What does this mean? There is specialization on the boat. Yeah. There is different teams on a boat focusing on areas and their perhaps 
perhaps they are, do not even know what the others do. Yeah, so the people on the helm do not even have a deep, deep, deep knowledge of what they on the boat do, but they have to click together. Yeah, and they are on a journey. A boat race takes three hours at least. Yeah, there are a lot of maneuvers. You don't know what comes. Yeah, you will never plan everything in advance, and you have to, as a team, face the challenges which you encounter during the journey during the race. Yeah, and this is something you have to embrace. Yeah, there might be sports people which are doing rather individual sports, saying I want to be a tennis player since then I do not have to rely on the team or I want to be a ski racer or something like that. Or there are others who want to be part or leading a team altogether. Yeah. And sometimes perhaps even complicated ones. It's a different whether you're on a boat team or on a soccer team. Yeah. And they already have it. Running a complicated business with a lot of faculties. Yeah. is very similar to doing a complicated sport as a team and as an as a individual player. And if you get satisfaction from getting these things over the finish line, then you can be likewise enthusiastic about these things in your professional life. I really take this an example often in my leadership of sites that we say, let's see when we are a boat team, how would we work together? Yeah. Also, also on a soccer team to make it more simple, there you have strikers and you have middle feet and you have defenders. Yeah. And it's, it's just everybody has to stick to his rule and has to know how he supports the other one and you only win as a team. Yeah, I love both of those analogies. I, I haven't thought of the boating one, but that certainly is a is a great analogy to business. So I always ask this question because I think everyone brings a unique perspective to this. When I started in payments about 15 years ago, there wasn't as much excitement around the industry. There wasn't as much investment. I don't even think the word fintech existed. Today, right, there's so much money being invested into it. It's a hot, sexy place to, to work. And I think kids coming out of college or university, they look at payments as a, or fintech, however you want to reference it, they look at it as a potential career sort of market to be in. So what advice would you give them if they're coming out of college, they say, hey, I want to go and work in the fintech industry. What advice would you tell them? What should they do to be successful? First of all, do it since I'm strongly believing that the fintech industry is a booming industry. Yeah. Why? There is so much also coming over, <laughs> spillover from the incumbent banks. Yeah. So only consuming the market that's today with uh, incumbent banks will be a huge market for uh, new techs and uh, new fintechs. Yeah. So do it. Yeah. I would always suggest. And since this is a, this is a suction effect, even more good talent. More and more good talent aggregates there. So join this talent pool. If it would be my son in six years, I would suggest him also to at least start a career down this path. Yeah. When it's then getting more strategic um, to what kind of venture or what kind of camp company to pick, I would actually say don't make it too complicated or don't join a company who claims to be too smart or too niche. I coming to a point in a second. Yeah. So for instance, there is a lot of small businesses who used to succeed or try to succeed now in, yeah, don't know, small deficient areas of the, of the market where they sneak in like, like smart routing or like getting the best price or um, the best example perhaps is load balancing. You know that if you're 10, 10 years in the market, yeah, obviously it was lucrative and tempting to be in the load balancing business, yeah, switching providers for the high risk business. But these kind of things which are working in these market inefficient niches, they tend to be not really sustainable. Yeah. And when it comes to load balancing, I see the example today with the smart routers where I say, come on, I take your transaction and then see which in an auction thing, which acquirer gives you the best price for this transaction. I think this is a little bit too intelligent to be sustainable. Yeah. I would rather pick those companies and join those companies which are bringing superior value to either their merchants or their resellers. Yeah. You will see that, that they have very strong, um, very strong and as opposed to dodgy reference customers they start with. Yeah. So if not a strong reference customer, at least one uh, believes in that company, why should you as a new joiner uh, believe with your talent in this company and be a little bit more sustainable and traditional and not looking into too fancy, too niche, too much, having found a golden egg in a market inefficiency uh, venture once. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground so far about you and, and your background, about the company, about the industry and where it's heading. Is there anything else you'd like to cover before we wrap up? Yeah, a lot and little. Well, again, payment, I can 
just encourage everybody to perhaps look after a career there since it's so super interesting. Yeah. You just mentioned a few things uh, today very much is card based, but you can do so much now with virtual card numbers, with tokenization. Then you already mentioned things like the blockchain and like crypto. And there you see what we already have on the plate here for the next three to four years. There's room for a lot of talent and for a lot of ventures. So let's be excited what the future brings. And uh, I could just invite everybody to also embrace career opportunities here since we need great people and we have great opportunities for great people. Okay. What would be the best way for people to learn more about the company? Yeah, join us in our blog channels, tag us in the respective corporate social medias, and then you get daily or weekly updates on, on knowledge pieces. Okay. Well, Chris, I thank you for your time. I know you're incredibly busy, so and your time is very valuable. So I really appreciate you being on the show today. My pleasure. It was fun. Hopefully some interesting insights, Greg. Absolutely. Great insights. I appreciate it. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.